Blazing deals, boundless options. It's hot grill summer at Whole Foods Market from June 14th through July 4th. Fire up the grill with quality cuts at the best prices. We're talking animal welfare certified meat. Check out the sales on bone-in ribeye, beef kebabs, and New York strip steak. Round out your barbecue with plant-based proteins, sliced cheese, soft buns, and all the condiments. Plus, sales on fresh strawberries, peaches, and more. Don't forget the pie, either. Get grilling at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. Before they opened an abortion clinic together, Diane Horvath and Morgan Nuzzo were friends. We have the kind of a fun origin story of where we work together and I was pregnant and Diane has a child that's older than mine and she started being like every six months or so she'd be like, hey, do you want a clothing dump of a bunch of kids clothes? And so we'd meet up and chat. And during those that's Morgan. She's a nurse midwife. Diane is an OBGYN. They'd both worked at abortion clinics before, at independent clinics and a couple Planned Parenthoods. Yeah, and we kind of talked about, like, you know, as you do with your, like, badass friends, you talk about your five and 10 and 20 year plans for what your life is going to look like. And it always kind of included the idea of having a clinic together at some point. But I don't think either of us really knew how to do that, what it would take to do that. Then, in December of 2021, they both happened to be out of a job. And they were paying close attention to the way the Supreme Court was leaning further and further to the right. And they were like, listen, we think Roe's going to fall. We know how to do later abortion. There are very few clinics that do it. Why not us? Why not now? We're as close as we're ever going to be to almost five year plan here. Let's let's make it happen. Morgan and Diane started looking at properties in Maryland which happens to be one of the southernmost states on the East Coast where abortion would remain broadly legal if Roe was overturned. All those people from Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas, West Virginia, Tennessee, when they needed an abortion, especially later in pregnancy, they were going to need somewhere to go. So Morgan and Diane gave themselves a crash course in running a business. They courted donors, talked to banks, got what they call a predatory loan. They started a GoFundMe, too. And all the while, they were keeping an eye on the Supreme Court, which was set to rule in a pivotal abortion case, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, in just a few months. So Morgan and Diane knew the clock was ticking. We were just kind of hustling as much as we could while we're watching the writing on the wall. Then, in May of 2022, while the two of them were having dinner together after a day at an abortion conference, the Dobbs decision leaked. It's like watching someone die. Like, you know it's going to happen, you know the worst thing is coming, and it still hurts when the moment comes. And so we're sitting there being like, all right, it's, it's, it has to happen. There is no other option for this clinic to not be open. Um, there's going to be this huge influx of people, this huge influx of need for care, especially for later procedures. We have to get this clinic open. There are only seven states, plus Washington, D.C., that place no limit on when a patient can terminate a pregnancy. Maryland is one of them. And even when later abortions are legal, not every clinic offers them. The patients who need abortions later in pregnancy are often younger. A disproportionate number are children who don't know what's happening to their bodies or are in denial or tried to hide it until they couldn't. Other patients are adults with deeply wanted pregnancies, but months in get a catastrophic fetal health diagnosis. Or they're people who knew they wanted an abortion but needed time to save up the money or get time off to travel to a clinic, which, now that abortion is illegal in huge swaths of the country, is an even more complicated and grueling undertaking than it was before. In her training, Diane had learned to do abortions later in pregnancy, which are a bit more complicated than earlier abortions, but it had never been the focus of her work. But I kept saying to myself for years, like, you know, third trimester care, later care is so important, but like, mm, I can't do it. Or it's not right for me in this point in my life. Or, you know, someone else is taking care of it. I, I think it was some of it was in just my own internalized like stigma. I also think some of it was fear. There's a lot of violence perpetrated against people who provide abortions. And certainly people who provide abortions later in pregnancy are really disproportionately targeted. I mean, some, some really heinous things have happened. I mean, George Tiller was murdered in his church. But I thought, I can't live my life and I can't allow these people, these bullies and terrorists to dictate my work, which I know is just and moral and necessary. 
Diane and Morgan spent a lot of time talking about what role they wanted their clinic to serve in their community and the country after Roe was gone. There was one memory that stuck with Diane from her previous job, where she and Morgan worked together. It was about one patient, a young girl, who needed a later abortion. And I remember asking her after her procedure what she was looking forward to the most when she went back home. Because her mom was saying she was in sports and she was so proud of her and everything. And I said, what are you looking forward to the most? And she said, you know, I just really want to go back to being a kid again. You know what I mean? And I had to like pause and go to my office and cry. And I went into the office and Morgan came in and gave me a hug. And I said, this is sacred work. This is work that gives people, this is like puts the universe back on the correct path. And and this, this little girl gets to go home and be a little girl. And so I just said, I can't, I can't not do this. I can't ever go on and say that this isn't important enough for me to be involved in. In October of last year, Diane and Morgan opened Partners in Abortion Care, a clinic in College Park, Maryland, that offers abortions in all trimesters of pregnancy. We have been seeing patients for about seven months now, and we've seen patients from over 30 states and three different countries. Over 90% of our folks get some sort of financial assistance, if not all of their fee covered by abortion funds, the National Abortion Federation. Uh, So these are folks that are in the greatest amount of need. They're traveling really long distances. I have probably once once a week or once every other week someone who's never been on a plane before. If you want to provide abortions for out-of-state patients, especially later in pregnancy, Maryland is a good place to be. It's really leaned into its role as a destination for people who need to travel across state lines for an abortion. For instance, just last month, the governor signed a new law that protects abortion providers in Maryland from being prosecuted or sued by other states for taking on patients who traveled to be there. Another new law helps protect patients with beefed-up privacy protections for medical records related to abortion. There's also a law that lets nurse midwives like Morgan provide abortions instead of just doctors. And Maryland has set aside funding to train them, which could relieve some of the increased burden on providers from out-of-state patients. And next year, Maryland residents will vote on an amendment that would enshrine abortion rights in the state constitution, making it much harder for any future legislature to take them away. In other words, in an uncertain future for abortion in America, Maryland looks about as safe as it gets, which means Morgan and Diane's clinic will have a lot more patients to see. We are full up and we are seven months and we've had to hire more staff. We've had to hire, like expand our schedule to accommodate the patients that we're seeing, and we know it's going to get worse with the restrictions as they make their way all the way up and down the the southern part of the eastern United States. We know that everybody's going to get pushed further and further towards the middle, and Maryland's the perfect middle right now. So when we thought about making capacity, I think even knowing all of the information, we still underestimated the need. This is The Waves. I'm Christina Cotarucci, a senior writer at Slate. This week, one year after the Supreme Court decision that set off a national crisis in reproductive health care, we're taking a look at what the end of Roe has wrought. The people traveling across the country to see Morgan and Diane to get their lives back. The people forced against their will into pregnancy and childbirth or denied life-saving medical care because their doctors are afraid of the law. And also, the people doing what they can to mitigate the damage with ballot measures and abortion funds, and the knowledge to help someone manage an abortion on their own. First, I'll talk to Elena Ramsey, who leads a faith-based pro-abortion group in Ohio that's been charting new ways to use the specific assets of faith communities to help people get abortions. We'll also hear from Jessica Valenti, a journalist who's been tracking the warp speed rollback of abortion access across the country and telling the stories of people whose lives have been upended because of it. That's next on The Waves. Stay with us. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by The Human Rights Campaign. The Human Rights Campaign envisions a world where every member of the LGBTQ plus family has the freedom to live their truth without fear and with equality under the law. The Human Rights Campaign is on the front lines, mobilizing to stop extremists and politicians from pushing their dangerous propaganda and legislating hate. This year's Pride is a moment when anyone who cares about the rights and safety of LGBTQ plus people 
must do more. So celebrate Pride this year by joining the nation's leader fighting discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community. Your support helps them change the narrative and change laws from the stories told in the media to the laws passed in state houses. At this critical moment in LGBTQ plus history, support the nation's leader in the fight against LGBTQ plus extremism. Donate today by visiting hrc.im slash donate and get your free sticker today. Make a generous gift this Pride Month and support the LGBTQ plus community and they'll send you the iconic HRC Equal sticker. Blazing deals, boundless options. It's Hot Grill Summer at Whole Foods Market from June 14th through July 4th. Fire up the grill with quality cuts at the best prices. We're talking animal welfare certified meat. Check out the sales on bone-in ribeye, beef kebabs, and New York strip steak. Round out your barbecue with plant-based proteins, sliced cheese, soft buns, and all the condiments. Plus, sales on fresh strawberries, peaches, and more. Don't forget the pie, either. Get grilling at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Christina Cotarucci. I first talked to Elena Ramsey last year, pretty soon after the Dobbs decision came down. Elena is the executive director of Faith Choice Ohio, a group that does reproductive justice advocacy and also direct service. I was writing a piece about the religious left and the way progressive faith leaders were finding ways to help people get abortions. We'll link to that piece on the show page. But I wanted to talk to Elena again a year later to check in on some of the projects she was organizing and to talk about what it's like to do this work in a state where abortion is still legal, but actively being contested by the Republican-controlled state government. Elena, so great to chat with you again. Hi, Christina. Glad to be here. Take me back to the immediate aftermath of the Dobbs decision. You know, what happened in Ohio and how did you respond? Oh, wow. It's been definitely a trying year. So, This is the one-year anniversary of our faith-based abortion fund called the Jubilee Fund. And we launched that anticipating, of course, what we knew that Dobbs was coming. Of course, there was that leak a couple uh, weeks before that. And uh, we had been planning on launching this abortion fund, but we absolutely (laughs) made it even more of a critical priority. And we wanted it in place because we knew that um, folks would have an even more difficult time accessing abortion. And so all we do is focus on practical support, helping people travel even further distances out of state as needed to get to appointments. And we provide that wraparound support because, as we anticipated, folks would need even more transportation uh, support. They would need, you know, lodging for multi-day appointments, uh, child care stipends, all the things that uh, go beyond just the cost of the procedure. Uh, so we were really thrilled that we were prepared in that regard. And yet when Dobbs came, even though we were anticipating it, there was definitely the grief and uh, the anger that comes with that. And so we also responded as a faith-based organization and provided a bit of that pastoral support the folks. Um, We had a space of healing and uh, of holding grief and lament. Um, We had different practitioners come in and just be able to process with people online and being community together. Gosh, because again, even if your head knows it's coming, our hearts were just heavy (laughs) with the realities. Ohio sort of was emblematic of the chaos that kind of happened after the Dobbs decision where y'all expected it would at least be a couple days or a couple weeks before an abortion ban might come into effect, but actually it went into effect immediately. Is that right? Oh, yes, absolutely. (laughs) We were also, yeah, knew that, you know, uh, that we had a six-week abortion ban that was just on the docket. And yet when... Dobbs happened, uh, it triggered it. It went into effect immediately. And that was a little bit unexpected. We thought we would have a couple of weeks uh, to adjust to that. But our very gerrymandered supermajority legislature, the powers that be the day of, decided, no, actually, we're going to implement this. And so 
I mean, all the clinics had to scramble everyone because when when there's a six week ban in place, that virtually makes abortion inaccessible because the majority of people don't even know that they're pregnant at that point. And so we had clinics who had to call patients, cancel appointments and or reroute them to other states, which, of course, then the rest of the system was overloaded as well because all the different um impacts across uh, the country, you know, state by state, just overwhelmed everything. And so it was, it was absolutely destabilizing, very chaotic. And we, we had to navigate that for about 10 to 12 weeks until then we could get um, some legal protections in place. And so now there is a stay or an injunction on that. And we are back to about 21 weeks, six days gestation for abortion availability. But the chaos remains. So many people continue to be confused. They think there is no abortion access in Ohio. They think the six-week ban is still in place. And of course, that is by design. I attended one of the workshops that you've been hosting um, over the past year on providing support for self-managed abortions, where people receive training on what medication abortion is, how to share that information with other people in a manner that's legally safe um, to, to protect them from being possibly charged with, you know, aiding and abetting an abortion. I was really impressed by the fact that, you know, your organization was taking this on and helping people prepare to give that information to others at a time when access was at risk. How have those workshops gone for you? What kind of feedback have you received? It has been good to be able to give people some hope, some options, knowing that, um, you know, regardless of what the state says, what the church says, that people will always continue to manage their own care and their reproductive lives and futures. And so those trainings continue to happen on a monthly basis. It's still very, very popular, um, especially even so now in the last um, few months as we see um, abortion pills, medication abortion come under attack again. But I will say that some folks, you know, take the training, but they're also still discerning their risks. And um, that is a lot harder to train people on of uh, being able to count the cost and uh, figure out how they want to leverage their privilege and be able to take those kind of risks to just go ahead and even share that information, even though we do it in such a way that really does safeguard people from any kind of legal liabilities. Some folks are still a bit wary about doing so. And it's just heartbreaking to me that the state and our government has really put people in this precarious position where they feel like they can't raise their voice, even when they have a legitimate way to do so. Yeah. I mean, how do you deal with that sort of frustration or disappointment and, you know, seeing what I imagine was a lot of initial enthusiasm for taking risks for helping make abortion available and then maybe seeing that not pan out as much as you'd hoped? Oh, that, <laughs> that has absolutely uh, been the reality. Um, with movements, there are waves, their initial, you know, there's a crisis point. And people mean well, and they want to respond. And so we did, we had a surge of folks either willing to donate or volunteer and say, hey, I will drive people across borders and so on. And at the same time, we said, okay, then we're going to equip you on how to do that. And we make them aware of what that actually entails. And for us, again, we're not going to put any of our patients in a car with someone who isn't fully trained and vetted. And so we have background checks. We have a full training that makes sure that folks are trauma-informed and anti-racist. And once people go through all of that, then sometimes people will back off because they realize like, oh, this is a greater responsibility and it as it is and it should be. You know, in some ways it's really good that people have discerned and figured out that's not the right role for them, but it, it can be very disappointing. And we, you know, try to find creative, more other outlets, ways for people to, to be engaged. And so like, for example, we're ramping up an abortion care package program where we can work with congregations, faith communities, and other groups so that they can be hands-on. They can create these care packages, and we can say, hey, these are people of faith 
who, because of their values, support abortion and are doing this for patients. And that does send a strong message to patients and knowing like, oh, wow, people, if they stand with me, it's not just uh, those um, extremists who've weaponized faith in many ways and have absolutely stigmatized and shamed abortion decisions. So that's another way that, you know, like we're, we're readjusting the ways that people can get involved. We, we just offer a menu of options. It's just a matter of adjusting with our expectations, our disappointments, and um, giving people just ample opportunity to show up in the ways that they say they want to be. Can you tell me more about how faith plays into this? I mean, you know, your website sells a shirt that says abortions are blessings. I feel like there are obviously a lot of people out there who have only or primarily heard from the far right extremist, you know, fundamentalist faith voices out there who oppose abortion. How do you explain, you know, your mission to them? Oh, yeah, this is (laughs) the the ever, ever present question for us. Uh, We do this work, you know, because of our faith and not in spite of it. But that really, I think, is a, a very powerful witness because, again, our, our opposition, they're very vocal, but they are the minority. There are those of you know other faith stripes and traditions that want to control people's bodies, um, want a very narrow view of their religion that really condemns others. And yet we are here to reclaim <laughs> that message and really assert that, no, um, many, many faith traditions actually call us to compassion. And so when we say that abortions are blessings, uh, we we absolutely mean that because it is a blessing for people to have their own uh, moral agency, their bodily autonomy, their right to self-determination, that that is powerful, um, that abortion is so common um, that everyone loves someone who's had an abortion. And so instead of it being this topic that is in the shadows, we really want to uplift it as a very normal part of our everyday experience. And so we really stand in that gap and help provide, um, you know, a way for people to bridge the knowledge gap of what it means to be a person of faith and support full bodily autonomy for everyone, but then also the compassionate action gap of, okay, what do you do with that then? How do you put your faith into action in the public square where people know that you're a safe person, that they can talk to you about these things? Because it's not just abortion. It's the ways that we've also relegated conversations about sexuality, our bodies into the shadows. And so, especially, unfortunately, in many faith spaces and churches that I work with, those communities don't talk about the struggles with um, infertility or miscarriages and pregnancy loss. And all of that is wrapped up into this conversation about abortion as well. And those are also the things that um, the opposition wants to control. (laughs) Um, Because when they say that, you know, they're just here to, you know, instill these abortion bans. No, now they're moving on and they're blocking gender affirming care. There's all these attacks on trans and queer youth. Um, It's going into, you know, whether or not people, yeah, can access contraception and fertility treatments. It just goes on and on. You know, even before Dobbs, but especially now, I know it seems to a lot of activists and advocacy groups that political advocacy kind of was having diminishing returns in a lot of states with Republican controlled legislatures. And I know now many people feeling like, you know, what are we doing here lobbying this this hostile legislature for something that's never going to come to pass, and especially in places with abortion restrictions? How have you confronted that question, you know, in the past year or more of how do we expend these limited resources in a state that, as you mentioned, is like incredibly gerrymandered and has a particularly hostile legislature for abortion rights? So there are about two avenues in which we could help address that. One, we're fortunate that we are one of the states. Um, Not all states have access to ballot initiatives to then amend constitutions. And our state allows that. And so it, it, it provides a check and balance 
to lots of the power grabs that we are seeing in our General Assembly, we take it to the ballot. And uh, that is what's happening right now in Ohio. There's this big fight and big push to get abortion protections codified in our state constitution. And not only abortion, it really does span uh, protections for miscarriage management, for facility treatments, contraception access. And there has been just great momentum. People are really feeling like, okay, they're not going to listen to us at the state house <laughs> because obviously um, of gerrymandering and voter suppression. Then we're going to take it to the ballot and be able to hopefully um, make those changes at that level. And we've seen that across the country from Kansas, Michigan, and other states being able to enact these kinds of protections via the ballot. Our opposition is also working hard to suppress those ballot initiatives. And we're looking right now at a special election that has been added on in August to change the ways that ballot initiatives are approved. And if the election (laughs) does not go well in August, then it then mandates uh, immediately for the November general election that any kind of constitutional amendments by ballot have to be passed by 60%. Um, oh, my God. The vote, which is, yeah, not the majority. That's not how elections work. No, it's not a simple majority. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so, I mean, it, it is daunting. And it, it tells us that, oh, wow, they're scared. If they have to <laughs> change the rules and um, be that devious about it. And then the other way is really the long-term narrative change that is needed that happens outside of the political system, the electoral system, because um, we're also here because many of um, our faith communities and and such have not been vocal, have not been on the front lines of these issues, have uh, really allowed, again, that very vocal minority to uh, take up all the air in the room. And so a lot of our work is transforming hearts and minds so that we can continue to sustain this, that this isn't even a a question um, in years to come. I won't say that faith traditions are always known for being on the cutting edge of ways to use laws in subversive ways. But, But then again, on the other hand, people of faith always have been the ones to, you know, open their doors to asylum seekers and, you know, people in need of all sorts. So I've been thinking more about uh, the different roles that sort of everyone has to play in this moment. And it does feel to me like there's uh, a lot of room for faith communities to have a huge effect in this moment. And how do you see the next years looking for you? Are, are you feeling optimistic in this moment? Or have you, have you um, you know, <laughs> been sort of trodden down by all that's happened in the past year? Yeah, I've been uh, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> One, pacing ourselves, pacing uh, my my energy and our teams. I took a sabbatical, you know, this year, even in the midst Good. of everything. That's awesome. Yeah, because it's like, you know what, if we're going to be here for the long haul, we also need to rest. And if I can't rest in the middle of all of this, then I never will. And so... Yeah, all of it is just a matter of sustaining what is happening. Uh, We have more than enough in terms of, you know, what can work, um, but we we need more people power. We need more resources. And so that's my job. I get to fundraise and build those partnerships uh, to get people plugged in and build the systems that we need um, on the ground. And so, like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic about all of it. It does take time. It takes the resources, but it is happening bit by bit. And there has been more of a willingness than there has been in the past to um, to partner with faith communities. There's a realization that's all hands on deck. We need everyone to help out. And, um, and we also have to earn that trust, right? Like, I get it that some folks in this movement don't have a lot of trust for people of faith because of what they've seen from the opposition who weaponize faith and toxic theology. And so we've been able to, yeah, make those inroads and teach others that actually, if we're going to get free, we get we got to do it together. And that our liberation is tied up to one another. And so... 
that's what gives me hope. It's what keeps me going is knowing that at least we don't do this work alone and there's more than enough <laughs> work to go around. Elena Ramsey from Faith Choice Ohio, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll hear from Jessica Valenti about her year of tracking abortion every day. Hey there. If you're enjoying this episode of The Waves and want to hear more about the year without Roe, check out Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? This week, they sat down with the CEO of Planned Parenthood. How has the end of Roe signaled a new beginning for the nation's largest abortion provider? That's on What Next, wherever you get your podcasts. Get comfortable, like Clarence Thomas on a conservative billionaire's yacht comfortable, and tune into Crooked Media's Strict Scrutiny to stay up to date on the latest Supreme Court decisions. I'm Leah Littman, and each week I'm joined by my co-hosts and fellow law professors Kate Shaw and Melissa Murray to break down the latest headlines and the biggest legal questions facing our country, from Mifepristone to trans bans. With the 2024 elections approaching, it's crucial to understand the impact of these decisions and how to fight back. So listen to new episodes of Strict Scrutiny every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Christina Cotarucci. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned, it's felt like every day brings some new terrible development in abortion law and some new terrible story about a pregnant person left to suffer until they're at death's door before a doctor will provide an abortion. It's a lot to take in. And Jessica Valenti is keeping tabs on all of it. In Abortion Every Day, her Substack newsletter... Jessica is writing the history of the demise of abortion access in the U.S. in real time. It's an essential resource and a great read, and I'm so glad to have her on the show this week. Jessica, welcome to The Waves. Thank you for having me. When did you launch the newsletter, and what made you want to write about this every day? <laughs> it, it was sort of already happening. I was, as soon as Roe was overturned, I was writing about abortion every day. I had an existing, you know, feminist newsletter. I was hoping that I wouldn't have issues to write about every day. I was hoping that there wouldn't be a story every day to, to write about. And as it turns out, every day is not even enough. I could, <laughs> I could be publishing abortion every hour. But you've also been writing about feminism and gender and politics for like two decades. So you've had a long time to think about how this might play out, how the past year might have gone. Would you say that things tracked pretty closely to the way we expected them to when Roe was overturned? I think so. But I also think, you know, as someone who grew up with uh, abortion being legal in, in my entire lifetime, there was no real way for me to visualize what this would actually look like, right? We knew what we expected. We knew what warnings we were giving uh, giving out, but there was no real way to predict exactly how bad this would be. I feel like it's so much worse than we thought. Just how quickly things are happening and how quickly they've devolved, I think, is is not necessarily something we would have predicted. We knew it would be bad. We didn't know it would be this horrible, this quickly. When you say, you know, that things have happened quickly, what in particular are you talking about? Everything. About how many horror stories we're seeing come out of these states, how quickly the anti-choice movement was ready to move in with their funding for crisis pregnancy centers, anti-abortion centers. I'm trying to change my language around that. Obviously, they were prepared to, to some extent. They've been preparing for this moment for decades but the speed at which they were able to make things so bad for so many people is sort of remarkable. And I think a, a big part of that is just the amount of fear that they were able to instill in individuals, in patients, in doctors, especially. And so watching that happen and watching that fear play out 
it's been really difficult. Also seeing the way that those consequences are having these ripple effects beyond just individual patients and individual doctors and individual stories, right? Like the way that we're seeing doctors leave anti-choice states and what that means for maternity wards and what that means for the maternal death rate and health rate. The domino effect, I think, that we knew would happen, those dominoes have fallen. What do you think has enabled the rapidity of this like total change in basically like the US healthcare system? I think a big part of it is the fear. I really do. I think that doctors know what the right thing to do is. They know what the standard of care is, but they also don't, understandably, they don't want to risk losing their license. They don't want to risk going to jail. And so when a law changes overnight that it's so unclear, right? And the laws that they say have exceptions. We know that those exceptions don't really work. We know that those exceptions aren't real. And so doctors are faced with having to make these de- these decisions around, do I give the standard of care or do I go to jail? Because those laws were enacted overnight, their care changed <laughs> overnight. And so did the way that patients are thinking about their own health and their own care and the fear that they have. One of the positives about the moment that we're in is that it happened with social media, which means that there is a lot of conversation happening. Um, And so people who are pregnant who need to get care do have more resources, right, available to them because they have the internet, they have, you know, Reddit groups, they have social media. Um, But it also means that the the scare tactics are everywhere and the fear has also spread. They don't know how to sift through it, right? They don't know what the latest law is because it changes so quickly, right? A law gets blocked and then it's unblocked. They don't know um, what's legal for them to do or not. They don't know what websites are safe for them to visit. And again, like this was part of the reason I wanted to do the newsletter was because the issue really does require keeping up with it every day because those laws, those websites, because everything changes so quickly. And so if people want the most up-to-date information, you sort of have to be updating it every day, you know, multiple times a day. The thing that I keep coming away with is just the suffering and not just the suffering for the people who are pregnant and can't get care, but the, but the people who have to live in states that don't see them fully as human and in internalizing, (laughs) right? Like that feeling and trying to figure out a way to live with that constant sense of fear um, and sort of, you know, state enacted intimidation, really. Yeah. One of the things that really surprised me was in Montana where abortion was protected and um, after the Dobbs decision, Planned Parenthood in Montana decided to stop providing abortion care for people from states, from, from out of state, which I was like, I'm sorry, Planned Parenthood, like whose motto is care no matter what. And also like something that's not even against the law, giving legal medical care to somebody just because they came across state lines, they can't obtain it from you. I feel like there's also been some disappointments for me on the abortion rights side from institutions that I really thought were super well equipped to step up and meet this moment. Hugely. I mean, there's honestly, we could have like an hours long conversation about this and about the, you know, the mainstream pro-choice movement and the very understandable tension that they're having with activists on the ground right now. And that was really disappointing. And I think in part, it was a result of many years of mainstream um, abortion rights organizations playing it safe and playing down abortion. You know, it's the safe, legal, and rare thing, right? Like for so long, these groups that got the most funding really played into that, really didn't make the, the proactive moral argument about abortion and really we're defensive about it. And I think that we're seeing that spill over into our post row reality where you're seeing things like this, where they're playing it so safe when they don't have to. And lots of organizations are doing this in a moment where we need to decidedly not play it safe at all. Right. Like one of the things I'm hearing a lot from uh, abortion rights activists who are local, like in abortion funds and, and state level activists is we need to think about the end of row as almost like freeing us from the constraints of Roe. And we have this moment 
to rebuild what abortion rights looks like in this country. And we can't fall into the trap of just like timidly fighting for a restoration of Roe, which did not protect us, which was not good enough. People still were not able to get the abortions that they wanted and needed under Roe. And so in this very messed up way, there is an opportunity here to to rebuild this and to do the right thing and to be proactive and to be like the most progressive, uh, you know, version of ourselves for a future for abortion rights that really helps people, all people. But unfortunately, again, that fear comes into play where there's so much fear that people are playing it way safer than they should. And again, listen, like I say this a lot. I'm in New York. Uh, I do this work from behind a computer screen. I don't know what it's like to try to pass a ballot measure in Ohio or Kentucky, right? And so I have a lot of respect for the people who are doing this work in these states who know the kind of people that they're working with, who know voters, who, you know, I understand that they understand the landscape better than I do, but it feels like this is a moment for pushing and not retreating. You mentioned the story you published about the 21-year-old in Texas who had just an unimaginable horror befall her. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and the person at the center of it? Yeah. Um, it was a, a woman that I call Terry, and that's not her real name, who's 21 years old, lived in Texas, had a wanted pregnancy. Uh, she went to her 15-week ultrasound appointment, was really, really excited. You know, she had her boyfriend with her. They had the names picked out. And as is the case in so many of these stories that we're hearing, they got horrific news when they saw the ultrasound. And essentially, the fetus had not developed at all above the neck. Um, and so there was no head. And obviously, a, a pregnancy like that, that fetus is not going to survive. Um, but because there was a weak heartbeat, there was no legal way for her to to have an abortion. Thankfully, she was able to go to New Mexico for care. But saying that sort of like plays down how horrible that is to have to travel, um, you know, 11 hours to a state where you don't know anyone to have to hide this from your friends and family. They didn't tell anyone because they come from a very, you know, religious anti-abortion community to feel completely isolated in a moment when they should have been surrounded with experts and choices and social workers and compassion, this very young couple had to feel fear and shame. And they talked about literally feeling like they were robbing a bank. Like when they were calling, when they were calling for out of state clinics, even though it's not illegal to leave the state for care, they felt like criminals. And to do that to someone in this moment, that is such a like a horrific, horrible moment when someone needs the most possible compassion and care is just so beyond cruel to me. It was just remarkable, but I was really grateful to her for sharing her story and, and being willing to talk about it because it is such a difficult thing. Um, and what really struck me, what was hard was speaking to, to both her and her boyfriend. They very clearly expected judgment from me too. Like they, as they were explaining the story, there was a lot of, but you know, like there really was nothing that we could do. And, you know, she had a, a pro-life OBGYN who was recommending to her that she should carry to term or as long as she could, because it would be emotionally beneficial to her to hold the baby without a head. And, you know, it just broke my heart because this like young girl, 21 is so young to me, this young girl is saying to me, you know, I, I did want to hold my baby, but I just, I, I just didn't think that like I would be able to be okay if I had to hold this baby without a head. And the fact that she felt like she needed to explain this to me, that I would somehow be judging her for this, absolutely broke my heart. Um, it made me feel sick to my stomach. And I don't think people understand that that is what these laws are doing too. It's not just that this this woman had to go through hell in order to be able to get absolutely vital necessary care. It's that this shame that she is being made to live with is it's inhumane. It's it's unthinkable to me. You know what's so hard is that there are so many more stories like that from people who are not coming forward who have too much of that shame to come forward who don't know that they can, right? There are so many of these these stories and not just people who got very sick, but like people who have died. Like I feel very confident that people have died because of these laws, but like those stories aren't being told yet for lots of different reasons. It is 
so bad. It is so bad. And the conservative response to all of this has just been bizarre to watch. Yeah. And uh, almost like pretending like these cases don't exist or like, or yes. blaming the doctors like, well, yes. of course a doctor should have been able to do that. Well, if you criminalize it and make it so that a doctor can do it, but then has to defend themselves in court and that's when their immunity comes. I mean, nobody's going to do that, obviously. No one's going to do that. I mean, it's sort of genius what they've done. Like, and, and the moment also really lends itself to blaming doctors. Like, you know, COVID is not over, but in that COVID era where there was so much conspiracy theories around doctors and like hate, hate directed at doctors, they picked a moment to do the same thing to say, this is because doctors are making bad decisions and doctors don't know how to read the law. And they absolutely should have been able to give that abortion. Or they're saying, oh, and that's, but that's not really an abortion. That's something else. That's a not abortion abortion. But in Texas specifically, that's just not true. There is no exception for severe fetal uh, abnormalities, even when those abnormalities are lethal, like full stop, there is no exception. And as you said, even when there is a exception in the law, it's nominal, it's not something that actually works. It's not something that doctors can, you know, actually take advantage of or feel safe risking. And so yeah, they pretend that these cases don't exist. Or the other thing that they're doing that I find really disturbing is that they're starting to push out stories of of women who chose their babies over themselves and died. And doing this like martyrdom uh, thing where isn't this brave, this woman who had cancer decided that she would forego chemotherapy, and she sadly died, but her baby is alive and she chose life. We are seeing more stories like that because they know that women are going to be dying. They know the maternal mortality rate is going to go up. And so they are trying to valorize this as the best, most amazing choice a woman can make in anticipation. Stories like the one of the patient that you just shared, you know, understandably, they've become a major focus of the horror that a lot of us have felt since the Dobbs decision, a lot of the reporting. But of course, like the main impact of these abortion bans are that people are giving birth and having children that they weren't ready or willing to have. And, you know, it's it's not a majority, you know, wanted pregnancies that have a terrible fetal diagnosis or a health complication. That's not something that a broader health exception to an abortion ban could fix. It's, you know, just an effect of abortion bans. But those stories are so much harder to report out. You know, there's not really data on people who don't want to go through with a pregnancy, but are forced to, for obvious reasons, a lot of people don't want to talk to a reporter about how they didn't want this baby that they're now a parent to. And, you know, feelings change. How do you think about that sort of relative invisibility of that impact of Dobbs? I just wrote a column about this a couple of weeks ago about how important it is that we're not solely focusing on the most tragic stories. Obviously, every abortion denied um, is important. We need to be talking about all of these stories. But every abortion that is denied is a tragedy. And I think we're not talking enough about like the profound existential harm that comes with forcing someone to be pregnant against their will. Like somehow we have lost sight of the fact that that in itself is this horrific, horrific violation of someone's humanity. And from a strategic point of view with pro-choice organizations, when you are solely focusing on the rarest, most tragic circumstances, you're giving Republicans the opportunity to say, you know what, you're right, we're going to compromise on this. And we're going to make sure that those people can get care, right. And that's what we have seen happen in places like um, North Carolina and Nebraska with these 12 week bans where they're calling them reasonable, they're calling them common sense, they're calling them, um, you know, sensible compromises, because, well, you know, we're allowing abortion in the first trimester, which first of all, they're not like, it's still impossible to get an abortion. But you cannot compromise on your bodily integrity and freedom. Like that's absurd. Yeah. You wrote another piece recently about the questions you think reporters should be asking these Republicans and especially Republican candidates about abortion. What do you think has been missing from the way conservatives have been confronted with the consequences of their actions? Yeah, it's just the humanity that's missing. I mean, that's that's what I wrote about. And that's what really kills me is that you know, yes, candidates need to answer questions about what they think about a federal ban and how many weeks into pregnancy they want to ban it and um, mifepristone and what they think about these court cases. All of that is important. But to me, the most important question is, 
how do you say that you believe in democracy and freedom and that you want to force someone to be pregnant? What would you say to someone who is sitting across from you? Like you are looking someone in the eyes who doesn't want to be pregnant. How are you explaining to them that they don't have a choice and that it's good that they don't have a choice, that it's correct that they don't have a choice. I want to hear them explain that. I want to hear them explain to me how that is moral and okay and and reasonable. And I think to me, that's one of the most powerful <laughs> messages that the, that the pro-choice movement has. And that does account for, for all of us, right? That does account for everyone. That's not just the tragic stories. It, it, it does get back to the, the idea that it is a profound harm to force pregnancy on anyone who doesn't want it. And by the way, something I wrote about is that they know that this is a profound harm. Like it is written into all of these laws that um, it doesn't count as a medical emergency. There is no medical um, exemption for someone who is suicidal. And they wrote those into those laws because they know that people will become suicidal as a result of being forced into pregnancies they don't want. And they are saying that's okay, right? They know that this is a harmful, horrific thing to do to people and they are not being questioned about it. They are not being questioned like, really, we're talking about real life people. We're talking about human beings. I don't want to hear about 12 weeks versus 15 weeks. It only serves Republican strategists and candidates to talk about 12 weeks versus 15 weeks and Roe versus not. No, like talk about the human beings that this is actually harming What do you expect we'll see in the next year? I mean, listen, I think we're going to see a lot. I think, unfortunately, we're going to see, I think we're going to see more of an exodus of doctors, OBGYN specifically from anti-choice states. And I think that is going to have a really horrific ripple effect. I think we're going to see more attacks on democracy in terms of ballot measures. You know, a lot of pro-choice groups rightfully are trying to restore abortion rights in states using ballot measures. And Republicans are just throwing everything at the wall to make that impossible if they can. And so I think we can expect to see a lot around those ballot measures in terms of making them impossible to pass, in terms of fighting them, um, anything that they can do to keep voters as far away from abortion as possible, I think is what is what we're going to see. Um, and so those are the, the two things that I'm thinking about a lot right now. Um, but of course, again, like the overarching, very horrific framework of all this that we're going to continue to see is the suffering, right? Like we're going to see more and more um, of these stories. And my hope is that a year from now that we will still find them as shocking and unacceptable as we do now. You know, I hope that we don't become jaded by them. Jessica, thank you so much for coming. Again, Jessica's newsletter is Abortion Every Day. Thank you for having me. It's only been a year since the Dobbs decision ended legal abortion in much of the country. It's hard to know what comes next. Right-wing politicians are intent on banning abortion however and wherever they can. Diane Horvath of the Partners in Abortion Care Clinic in Maryland says she's mentally prepared for the worst. I think that we are not foolish enough to believe that there won't be a federal ban of some kind or a federal gestational limit of some kind. Um, It's the same people that used to say that Roe was not going anywhere saying, well, there'll never be a federal ban. It's like, no, yo, we stopped listening to you because it's it's only going to take a couple of bad elections to have the potential to have a a federal ban. But for now, Diane and Morgan are doing what they can where they are, to serve the patients who come to them for care that's becoming harder and harder to find. So we're talking about the five-year plan uh, involving some bigger space uh, and more staff, and and we want to continue to hire. And and like I tell my dad, who's conservative, that I'm a job creator now, so I'd like to create more jobs. The work can be hard, Diane says. It's so rewarding to care for a patient and hear them say, as many of them do, I've never felt so supported and cared for as I did here. But it's also heartbreaking to know they've traveled so far in many cases in defiance of the shame and the threats and the punitive laws that hang over pregnancy decisions in this country when those patients should be cared for just as well at home. There was one moment in particular, Diane remembers, that drove home the bittersweetness of starting a new clinic in this time of crisis. There was an abortion clinic in Georgia that was planning to close because of her retirement and ended up closing sooner than expected because of the Dobbs decision. Diane and Morgan heard about it, and they got in touch with the owners. 
they ended up buying a whole load of their medical equipment and furniture from that clinic. It was both like joyful and awful. And I remember um, walking up to the clinic and Morgan and I just like stood outside and cried because it was like, this is the beginning of our dream and the end of somebody else's. That's the show this week. Thank you again to Diane Horvath, Morgan Nuzzo, Elena Ramsey, and Jessica Valenti for talking to me on the show. The Waves is produced by Shana Roth. Daisy Rosario is senior supervising producer of audio at Slate, and Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio. We'd love to hear from you, as always. Email us at thewavesatslate.com. We've got no Slate Plus segment this week, but we would still absolutely love it if you'd become a Slate Plus member. We have a special series recapping, and just like that, the Sex and the City sequel that is exclusive to Slate Plus members. Just go to slate.com slash the waves plus for all that. The Waves will be back next week. Different hosts, different topic, same time and place.